Good morning, New Life Manitou. Would you guys stand with me for the scripture reading? My name is Dan Glass. I am over the AV Tech team, uh, so I don't get up here very often, but I figured I would read the word today. So it'll also be on the screen, but we're reading out of Colossians 1, verses 21 through 29. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you and, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ, to this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Remain standing, if you would, as we pray. Lord, we thank you that you have redeemed us. You have reconciled us to you, and you have made us in your sight. It says here in this scripture, in your word, you have made us without blemish and free from accusation. And so, Lord, we praise you. We lift up our hearts to you. We open our minds to you and what you want to say to us this morning. We pray in your name and God's people shouted. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Thanks for coming today. It is so good to see you. Um, we, I gave you an assignment. Do you remember last week I said, if you read Colossians, I will give you something. Candy? It's not a candy. It's a, you don't want to eat this, actually. It, we, get, we do this for all of our, we have a volunteer team. Uh, we, we set up in the morning. Uh, we just rent this building, so there's a lot of uh, setup to do and then tear down to do. And there's a team that there's coffee downstairs, uh, the secret location. If you ever wondered and wanted coffee, it's downstairs. Um, but there's just lots that happened. The parking lot was cleaned yesterday. We have a volunteer team. And whenever we see each other doing awesome things, we say, you rock. And we give each other a little rock. And it's literally just a pebble and someone has decorated these ones. So I have little rocks. Uh, Sarah, would you mind handing out these rocks to anyone who raises their hand? So if, if you read any, throw don't throw them. Because last week we had an incident. Remember last week, if you were here with, uh, so uh, Linda, uh, okay, yeah, hand them out. And uh, we'll get all the rocks out to the people who read. And this book of the Bible, if you have a Bible, open it up, get into uh, Colossians chapter one, and we're going to put up a map up here uh, of the ancient world. This is modern day Turkey. There you see this ancient city of Colossae kind of right in the middle to the right. Um, I was born, and my parents are here, Joe and Rosemary. So if you see, do you see Tarsus on the map? Uh, just north of there is a modern day city of Adana, and outside of Adana is a, as a U.S. Air Force Base, and that's where I was born. So this part of the world is very special to me because I was born there, and it happens to be the text that we're looking at today. We think, we don't know this for sure, but Paul says he's in prison. We think he was in Ephesus, a city just to the east, west of uh, uh, Colossae, and Paul is writing to Colossae, this city, telling the people, first and foremost, we talked about it last week. If you were here, we talked all about Jesus. Paul says to this city that he's probably never been, because he mentions in this letter, there's some clues that I don't know you, but here I am writing to you and, and greet Epaphras, who is this leader that started the church. And he writes to them, telling them about Jesus. And if you were here last week, we talked about Jesus, the creator, the image of the invisible God, the one who is and was and all things have been created through him and for him and from him. He is all things, that is Christ. And then today, if we continue down in chapter one, we've spent three weeks now in chapter one. If we continue in chapter one, we get to verse 21. And here Paul starts talking about us. Everybody say, me. me. He talks about us. And so we, at this point, get to look at this scripture and this set of verses and say, here's Paul telling us who we are. And it's a really, really, really good thing because it talks about how we have been reconciled. 
It says this, though. This is past tense. Once you were alienated from God, this is verse 21, um, once you were alienated from God, you were enemies in your minds. You were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. Think about that. You're enemies with God, but it's in your mind because of your evil behavior. Verse 21 says, but now he has, you see what it is? Now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Without blemish and free from accusation. How does this salvation work? Think about that. There's, there's people in here, uh, maybe you're visiting, I see some visitors, uh, or maybe you've been coming for a while and, and you really just like, okay, I keep hearing people talk about being saved. What is this? I would like to get saved. I would like to just learn more about this and know for sure, because there's other people in here that talk about how they know for sure that they have been reconciled and they have been saved. How does this work? Well, it's a big word called soteriology. You want to say it? soteriology, and it has to do with how we are saved, when we are saved, and, and it has to do with justification, sanctification, and glorification. These are really important theological words, kind of nerding out a little bit, just a little bit today. A couple weeks ago, uh, we really nerded out. That was just last week, but then we'll just nerd out a little bit, talk about soteriology. I was uh, walking in Manitou. I think this is last um, summer. I was just walking around. I think I was trying to find in the back of the Manitou newspaper, is a where is it? Have you ever seen this thing? And someone takes a picture in town of something and you have to find where that is and you write in, you get your name in the paper. I do this every single week, me and my boys. But yeah, so anyways, I'm walking around town and, and uh, trying to find this where is it. And I see a guy with a Christian t-shirt on, which just makes me happy. I enjoy seeing other people with Christian t-shirts on. And I've said this before, the cheesier, the better. It just brings a big smile to my face to see a believer just, just openly declaring Jesus. And if it's cheesier, the better. My son has a shirt that has a picture of a taco and it says, do you want a taco about Jesus? <laughs> that's, that's just genius. That's great. Anyways, um, so I see this guy, I forget what the t-shirt was exactly, but he's wearing a Christian t-shirt and he engaged just me in a conversation. And he's, he's really good. Sometimes you run into street preachers who just love telling people they're going to hell and they seem like they just hate people. Those people can, can do something else. But this guy was just a nice guy. He was, he was wonderful to talk to. He engaged me in conversation. And then I can tell the conversation was going in a spiritual, spiritual way, which I just appreciate. I thought this guy is really bold. He's out here engaging in conversation, sharing his faith. I see Terry Bracken doing that sometimes in Manitou, just outside engaging people in conversation leading them to faithful things and things of the faith and engaging them. So this guy was doing that to me. And I could just tell, I'm a pastor. I know where this conversation's going. I know what this guy's doing. And for some reason, I don't know why I do this, but I was messing with him. Like, why? Like, he's a nice guy. He's sharing the, the, his faith with me. And it, he, I, th I think he kind of had this, uh, like a, a script kind of routine thing that he said. And so we got into conversation. It really wasn't that awkward, but he begins to ask about faith. And he says, so where do you think you'll go when you die? And, and the answer is supposed to be uh, heaven. And, and then usually, uh, you know, in this conversation that usually goes uh, as such, he says, well, why do you think you're going to heaven? And then Christians would say, because of Jesus. And, and other people would usually say something like, well, because I'm a good person. And then that would open up into conversations and, and so on and so forth. Anyways, this guy asked me, where do you think you'll go after heaven? And, and I quoted the line from the Nicene Creed. I said, I, I think there, I will wait for the resurrection of my body and life in the world to come. And he looked at me like, what religion is that? Like, what are you saying right now? And it's just what we believe, by the way. Uh, but, the, but the answer, the simplified answer is heaven. But I kind of spelled it out and said the resurrection of the body and the life of the world to come. And he was just like, what do you mean? So then he just like asked a follow-up question. He says, well, are you saved? And for some reason, I should have just said, yes, I'm a pastor. I'm a Christian. We're friends. And instead, I'm, I don't know what's wrong with me. I decided to say, well, I have been saved. And I am being saved and I will be saved. And he was just like, are you like, you're not 
playing this game. Like I have the script. And, and then I, I, he said, well, what in the world do you mean? And so I got to explain, well, this is soteriology that we look back in our faiths. And, and those of us that have been redeemed and we say we have been saved. We are justified because of the work of the cross. And currently present day in this moment that just always is fleeting from us in the present, we are being sanctified. The Lord is walking with us and the spirit is making us new from the inside out. And we are choosing right instead of wrong only because of the power in us in Christ. And then we will be saved. We will be glorified. And we could talk about heaven and the resurrection and, and the afterlife and all that. And he was like, oh, so you're a Christian. <laughs> like after, I was like, yes, I am. Sorry, I messed with you. But that is, this is what we believe. We believe in salvation. We believe we can be reconciled to God. And we can get into all this heady theological stuff, but oftentimes Jesus would just tell a story. And one of my favorite stories about how salvation works, and maybe it's one of your favorites too, is the story of the prodigal son. A son comes to his father and says, basically, dad, you're going to give me money when you die. Yeah. Can I have that money now? As if you're dead. Can I just have all that money and peace out? And the father in this story, in this metaphor, in this parable gives the son all the money that he would get when he died. And the son goes out and he just lives crazy. He lives wild. He's it's luxurious living parties and so on and so forth. Spends all of his money, has nowhere to go, gets a job tending pigs, the unclean animal. And it says in scripture, this story that Jesus tells that he longed to fill his belly, to eat the food that even the pigs had. And he came to his senses and said, maybe I can go back to my father's house and just be a hired servant. And so when he's on his way, he sees his dad when it's like his dad sees him when the the son is still a long way off. It says this little detail in the story and the father comes running. He runs to the son, which is just an image. Even now I'm thinking like, this is an emotional. So I don't know how many times as a Christian, I've heard this story. I don't know how many times as a preacher, I've preached this story, but a father seeing his son way off when the son had run away and the son's coming back, the father runs to this son and their reconciliation happens. And that is what the kingdom of God is like when we go to the Father and we say, I'm so sorry, would you forgive me? Then the Father runs to us and there is this miracle of reconciliation that happens. And here's what it says. It says in verse 22, he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, free from accusation. And and so that's why we have the cross in this room. This is Christ's body on the cross, dying for us. And we are somehow, this miracle of Christ's work, made without blemish and free from accusation. And what do we have to do? Verse 23, if you just continue, if you continue, if you stay in the Father's house, if you continue in your faith, establish and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. So how does salvation work? What is soteriology all about? Well, it's about reconciliation. It's a simple story as a son coming to the father and saying, I'm so sorry. Now just, what do do I have to do now? Well, all you have to do is just stay here in this house. Just live here. Be established and firm. Continue in your faith. That's what it's all about. Just stay here. Stay with the father in his love and you have been redeemed. It even says, think about this. You've been made without blemish and free from accusation. Just continue in the faith. Um, Brett and I, wherever he is, he speaks, uh, he's back, there he is, uh, spoke three weeks ago. We were just talking two weeks ago about the, the just coming to church every Sunday and, and that in itself being this miraculous thing that changes us from the inside out. Uh, Eugene Peterson says, a phrase that he's kind of coined. He wrote a book called The Long Obedience in the Same Direction. And this is, this is what faith often looks like. This is what faith should look like. We come to church. We are the people of God who remain the people of God because we just live and we stay in the Father's house. And it's just this long obedience in the same direction. I have a friend, I was just telling Laura, I have a friend who's a doctorate of literature. And every couple years, it's usually like two years, he gives me a book list, which is somewhere between five and ten 
10 books and it takes me like two years to read five or 10 books. But anyways, uh, I'm, I'm now reading this book that he recommended. I would never read this book, but it's a baseball book. I'm not a big baseball fan, but he said the book is great. It's called Moneyball and a movie came out a, a little while ago and it's a fascinating read. It's, it gets into the, the data of baseball and it says like there's these big home run hitters that, that are always swinging for the fences and they're fun to watch and they hit and they make these big plays. But more often than that, they usually strike out. And what this book is, are kind of argues about is like the new way of understanding baseball and how teams win, not just players hit big home runs, but how teams win. And this guy, I guess it's based on a true story from the early 2000s, is the OBP, the on-base percentage. If you're a baseball fan, come talk to me later and correct everything I'm saying wrong. But anyways, the OBP is like just how many times you get on base. And it doesn't matter if you hit the ball to get on base or if you were able as a, as a batter to see that this ball's coming and it's going to be a ball, not a strike. And so you don't even swing because four balls and you get on first base. And it doesn't matter, according to this percentage, it doesn't matter if you got on first base because you hit the ball or you saw that there was going to be bad pitches and you ended up walking or if you got hit by the ball, you just got on base. And that's much better for a team to just get players on base. And for us this morning, here's why I'm telling this analogy, don't get lost in baseball right now. Here's why I'm telling you is that for us, getting on base is coming here, worshiping the Lord, spending time getting to know each other, spending time in this community, worshiping God. Those of you that read Colossians, yes, that this is what it means, that being faithful, giving your life to Jesus, and just it's from, from the outside looking in, this can look mundane. Like we're just, you know, every day, uh, some of us read the Bible. I, I know I do. Every Sunday we come to church, and doesn't that seem like a boring life? We as believers from the inside would say, no, this is staying in the Father's house. This is worshiping the Lord. This is for us getting on base, and that's what's going to win the, the game in our lives, just continuously of the long obedience in the same direction, staying in the Father's house. So that was all point one, my introduction. God has reconciled you. Here's point two, rejoice in suffering. This is what Paul says after he says who we are, that we have been reconciled. Paul says, now I rejoice. This is verse 24. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you. I am filled up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. For the sake of his body, which is the church, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present you the word of God in its fullness. We rejoice, Paul says he rejoices in his suffering. Think about how different that is than the world. Is it, does the world we live in rejoice in suffering? It's like, no, we rejoice when there's uh, the, the world around us rejoices when, you know, there's bigger, there's better, there's more pleasure to have. We rejoice in parties. We, we don't rejoice in suffering. And yet Paul, because his mind is set on the kingdom of God, he is able to say, I rejoice in suffering. He's doing the right thing for the right reasons, and he's suffering. Has anybody ever, you ever, do, ever get in trouble for doing the right thing? Like truly in your mind, you knew and in your heart, like this is the right thing to do. I'm going to do this. And then you get in trouble. I saw a couple hands go up. Like there's, there's this smile that comes out of your heart when you get in trouble for doing like truly what you know and believe to be the right thing, right? Like just like, well, I'm going to get punished for this. Oh, well, I guess I'll get punished. I did the right thing, and I know it was the right thing, and I could just walk out with this smile knowing that God is with me, and I chose what is right even though I'm suffering. I knew this uh, young man uh, back when I was in college. I was visiting uh, Florida State, uh, uh, the Tallahassee, and there was this kid who wasn't in college, but he was college age, so he came to this college group. The truth be told, he had a lot of uh, mental disabilities, and he, he was just a joy to be around. He's always saying, God bless you. God bless you. Instead of saying hi or bye, he said, God bless you. And it was just a wonderful kid to be around. And he got a job as a bagger at a grocery store. If you're from Florida, you, you've heard of Publix. It's a grocery store. Anybody know what Publix is? In this? Okay. Oh, wow. Everybody. I thought it was a Tallahassee thing. Anyways, so this kid got a job at this, at this grocery store. And every single time he would bag people's groceries, he would say, God bless you. If someone sneezed, he'd say, 
God bless you. If someone walked in the door, God bless you. Instead of saying goodbye, he'd say, God bless you. And he had this manager that did not appreciate that one bit. He had this manager, to be honest, looking back, like what a what kind of a jerk of a guy. Here's a guy with special needs that just says, God bless you. And so the manager came up to this kid and said, you need to stop saying, God bless you. I don't appreciate you. I don't appreciate your religion. Uh, and it just went on and on. And, and, and so this kid was told to stop. And he tried. Like this kid was like, okay, at, at work, I can't say God bless you. And so he really did try, but someone would sneeze or someone would leave or someone would come in and he just automatically would say, God bless you. That was just, it just came out of him with this big smile. And so the manager said, if you, okay, if you say it one more time, you're going to get fired. And so of course it was just a matter of time before something happened. And this kid said, God bless you to somebody. He was fired on the spot. I see him later that day at youth group at the college group. And I knew that he had been fired that day. Someone told me the word spreads quick. Uh, and, and, and so I was like, how, how are you doing? Expecting him to just say, oh, I'm doing horrible. This is the worst day ever. And instead he he said, I'm doing great. I got fired today for saying, I, God bless you. Like he was just happy about it. He, he knew that he, you know, he had tried to say, stop saying God bless you, but he couldn't because it just came out of him. And the joy that was in this kid, and even though he was going to suffer because he, he had lost his job, like there was something in him that rejoiced in suffering, like Paul is saying here. Paul rejoices in in his suffering. Here Paul is, he says later in this, uh, the book of Colossians that he's in jail. He's in prison writing to you, Colossae in the Colossian church. And yet he's suffering and he's suffering with joy, writing to these Colossians. I think about Paul being like uh, the, the CEO of the early church. Like here's the guy, like he's the man, he's the president. He's the, just the man when it comes to the early church, right? I mean, if you met Paul, you'd be like, wow, this is Paul, the real deal. You know, Paul uh, as a CEO per se, you know, hang with me here, you know, should be living the good life. You know, CEOs of the Fortune 500 companies, somewhere the average, I looked it up this this week, the average CEO of the, the good companies, the first, you know, top companies make 15 million dollars. That's some good money per year. And Paul is like a CEO in this early church. Just hang with me. He should be driving Ferraris and living in castles and just luxurious living and uh, like tigers and gold leashes and stuff. And instead, where is he writing from? Jail. He is suffering. He considers himself a servant. He says, I've become a servant. Why? Well, in Paul's mind is the knowledge of the truth that Paul is living in the kingdom of God. His mind is set on the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world doesn't much matter to Paul because it's all about the kingdom of God and telling people about the hope of Jesus and telling people about the word of God. So Paul gets into this. He says this in verse 26, a mystery. Do you guys like mysteries? Yeah, a mystery. The mystery that's been kept hidden for ages and generations is now disclosed to the Lord's people. Verse 27, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. So the Gentiles would be like everybody else that's not Jewish. The, the mystery of God came through Israel and now it's been revealed to everybody. The mystery. Do you want to know what it is? You're like, some of you have the Bible and you see what's next and you know what it is. But some of you are like legitimately like, yeah, what, what is this thing? What is this mystery that's so great? What is this mystery where Paul says you can be reconciled and without stain or blemish? What is this mystery where Paul is even in jail saying, I rejoice because of this suffering? What is the mystery? Christ in you, the hope of glory. What a wonderful phrase. So think about it again. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Who is Christ? Well, well Paul talks about that. We, we, we talked about it here last week. We said he's the creator. He's the Lord. He is over all things. And in him is created all things. And this Christ is in you, the hope of glory. You know, once you were alienated from God and enemies in your minds, but now you have been made full and, and redeemed and Christ is in you, the hope of glory. I brought an illustration. Do you like illustrations? Yeah. Okay, so this is you. Everybody say, that's me. That's, me. that's, that's you. I, I put the words you on it, so that's you. And, and Paul says, once you were alienated and once you were, had sin in you and once you were in sin, this is how you were. So this piece of paper, uh, a little envelope, 
It has the word sin on it, and it could represent any kind of sin. I made it the envelope. Uh, and by the way, this is not my analogy. I've, I've seen this before preached, and I just thought it was, this makes a lot of sense. This is a physical demonstration of, of what uh, you are, you were, I should say, and sin inside of you. So we'll put sin inside of you. This is how you were, Paul says, and we'll close it up. That's you with sin inside of you. Good or not good? Not good. Not a good situation. Alienated from God. Enemies, Paul says, in your minds because of the evil behavior. And so if this isn't bad enough, you have sin in you and you have this box that I, that I labeled. Uh, if anybody wants this later, you can't have it. It'd be weird to have a Tupperware with the word <laughs> sin on it. Um, but this is sin. And so you, sin is in you and you were in this box of sin. A pretty bad place to be, Right. You see yourself in there with sin inside of you, you inside of sin. And this is the condition. Like we, we look at this and say, this is how we were. And I think many people, and I think if we were honest in here, we'd say, yeah, it was, it was bad, but it wasn't that bad. And I think if we brought this analogy out to Manitou Ave and we were like, so this is you in sin and sin is in you. I think most people would say, well, I'm not that bad. I'm a pretty good person. Uh, I think everybody in here would say, I know someone who's worse than me. And I know a couple, I know of people who are a lot worse than me, like bank robbers and murderers and on and on. Like that's them. They, they were once in sin and sin was once in them, but I'm a pretty good person. I think about the, the slow steps it is, you know, when we think about someone who's really bad, think about a bank robber. Well, that bank robber probably didn't just wake up one morning and say, I'm going to rob and I'm going to, I'm going to steal. And if I need to kill people just to get money, I'm going to do that. That, that. People don't wake up and do it. There's slow progressions and then they end up in this place. It's like, I'm sure you've heard of the, the fable of the, the, the frog in the kettle. You put a frog in hot water. What does he do? Jumps out. You put a frog in cold water and you turn up the heat slowly. And supposedly, at least an analogy, hang with me, the frog just sits there and boils to his death because you turned up. Sorry for that image. Uh, but that's, I saw some of you like, have you never heard that before? But anyways, that's in the, in this fable, that's what happens. And I think about this, like, like we could, we could always say, oh, there's somebody worse than us. That's somebody else. But like, this is the condition of us. Like we have sin inside of us and we are in sin. And, and no matter, you know, who else is worse than us, this is the condition of the human race. What are we to do? Well, Paul says that you have been reconciled, that we can be reconciled. So we get ourselves, excuse me, Christ takes us out of sin. Christ takes sin out of us to be fully reconciled with him. Put that over there. And instead... What is the mystery that's been, you know, hidden for ages? Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so I found uh, a, a little battery-operated candle that says, what on it? Christ, if you could read that. And the Christ is the light of the world. Christ is now in us. Is this a great image? Yes. yes, like Christ is in us. We've been reconciled. And I have another box with Christ written on it. Christ, we are in Christ and Christ is in us. Can somebody say amen? amen. Like, amen. This is a much better place to be. This is Christ in us and we in Christ. Can you get the other mic? Okay. They're working on it. I think you could all hear me. Um, Christ in us and us in Christ. Let me hold it up again. Give me a second. And, and just consider this image. Consider this miracle that Paul says that we are in, like we are in Christ and Christ is in us. I think about what this looks like in, in the world around us. Uh, I was talking to Sean. I don't see it. Sean Springsteen here. He, he was telling me on Thursday, I was at a men's group and he said that uh, during the Black Forest Fire, do you guys remember in 2013? fire. He said right before his, uh, he started the school year, he was a wrestling coach. And he said one of his students lost everything. And he said that there was a, a day when they saw the clouds and the, the plumes. I think many, were, were you guys around? How many of you around when that happened? Uh, he said that he had a student, uh, saw the plumes and the fire come in. 
And he said that he, 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 this young man got his brother, got his mom, and got his Bible, and got out of the house, and they lost everything. And the story goes on to say, that Sean was saying that they, had, they were renting, and they did not have renter's insurance, so they just lost everything. And so Sean sees this wrestler, this kid, on the day that you know, they start to back up, and said, how are you doing? This, this fire, he knew that this fire just destroyed everything. And this kid with a smile on his face just said, I got everything everything out of the house that I really needed, that I cared about. My mom, my brother, and my Bible. And it was that attitude of, of Christ in him, the hope of glory, that just led this, this wrestling team. Sean was going on and on about how that just, just ended up being a foundation for that year. I think about Christ in us, the hope of glory. What does this look like? I think about John and Linda. They are very open about this. They have ministries that, that help people in grieving. They lost their son years ago to suicide. And, and just the Lord help them. Like, like, uh, like, but Christ in them, the hope of glory. John and Linda are now lead grief share. Uh, Linda has written a book, writing a book right now, helping others in the worst moments of their life. How are they able to do this? Like they went through so much. Christ in them, the hope of glory. Think about someone in here. I didn't ask to share the story, so I won't say their name. But, but usually in, in the world of business, you climb the corporate ladder and you kind of twist and, and push people down to, in order just to, to get more, you know, get more out of the company and, and go further and further and further. But instead, this company is, isn't just what it should be, Christian speaking, and it's, and it's, they, they kind of, he wants to shepherd people. He wants to, he cares more about the people than the job. And so he got into this position that the world would say, yeah, that's the best position you could be in. And instead he took a step back and said, I would rather have this position because I want to care about people in this place that is pretty nasty. And, and why is he able to do that? Like the world would look at him and say, you know, why aren't you keep climbing higher and higher? Why? Because Christ is in him the hope of glory. Christ is in us, and we are in Christ, and this is a very big deal. Would you bow your head with me this morning? Invite the band up. Um, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is, is look at chapter 1, and I'm going to say the things that Paul says about us. So this is the word of God to us. These are things that Paul says about us and who we are. And this is all just from the first chapter of Colossians, the, the chapter we've been looking at for the last three weeks. And I want you to, to meditate, to pray on, to receive these things. These are things Paul, in the word of God, says that we are. So listen to this. It says, God's holy people. This is how this chapter is introduced. God's holy people. That's us. Faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul calls us in verse 5, the fruit bearers. In verse 13 says, he has rescued us. It says he has brought us into the kingdom. It says we have redemption in him. Verse 22, what we read today, he has reconciled you. And he presents you holy in his sight. And we read this today, without blemish, free from accusation. And verse 27 says, there is glorious riches of the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Would you stand with me this morning as we pray? Lord, we thank you that you have reconciled us this miraculous work that you do inside of us, putting yourself inside of us, allowing us to be in you, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And Lord, all we need to do is come to you and say we're sorry. All we need to do is come to you and say, Lord, would you reconcile us to yourself? We have sinned. We've moved away from you. But Lord, we come back running like the prodigal son who runs to you as you run to us, Lord. And that there on this road is reconciliation. Lord, we, we strive for that. We want that. We come to you saying, sorry for what we have done. We do not want to be enemies of yours in our minds. We do not want to be alienated from you, but we want to run into your arms and receive reconciliation. So we praise you, Lord. We worship you because you were able to do that. Would you in unison pray this prayer with me? It's a 
confession, a prayer of confession that we will say and, and pray together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we might delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen.